Okay, guys, uh, welcome to American History. Uh, this is chapter 15, section 3 right here, okay? And we're going to talk about political machines. Uh, I've told you this really important section of chapter 15, okay? All right, so understand something about political machines. Very simply, I think this sums it up as good as anything. It is services for votes. So we're going to have, you know, uh, basically we've talked about all the immigration coming into cities. You're getting ethnic neighborhoods, at Little Italy, Little China, things like that. So let's say in Little Italy that things are kind of run down a little bit. And you've got somebody like myself who's seeking office and, and seeking to be elected in as something, okay? Well, I'm going to go to the people in Little Italy and I'm going to say, listen, uh, this is ridiculous. You should have a playground for your children. You should have basic sewer functions here. Um, you're being treated poorly. And if you vote me in, I'm going to change all that. Well, the people are like, okay, at least try. Uh, they vote me in and I turn around and do exactly what I told them I was going to do and I make their lives better. I have won them over. Let's say I'm a Democrat. Well, let's say, let's say I'm a Republican, okay? These people have become Republican because I have uh, I've done them a service, and they've provided me votes, okay? So from the immigrant perspective, political machines could be very helpful. And these political machines are gaining control of these cities. Um, now, some of the problem with it is, is some of the corruption that comes with it. You know, what they don't know is that that playground that cost the city $750,000 really only cost $200,000 to make, and I pocketed the rest as graft, you know, uh, and which we'll talk about a little bit later down here, okay? So keep that in mind when we're talking about political machines. Now, here was basically the three groups. At the top, you had the boss, okay? And then you had his captains who were kind of organizing below him. And at the base level, the precinct workers are the ones going around talking, gathering votes, uh, from these immigrants. Now, what's the role of the political boss? Well, he controlled access to jobs and licenses. So um, he's basically, it's kind of like a patronage system. I'm helping people out who help me. So I'm going to get Timmy a job because Timmy gave me a vote. Um, they have a lot of power, so much power that they're able to influence courts. Uh, usually that comes in the case of uh, bribery. Um, everybody likes a little extra money in their pocket. So some of these judges were not uh, very ethical, and they took these political bosses bribes. Um, now, there are some good things that the political machines did. Not all political machines were necessarily uh, totally bad. Uh, they're giving money to schools and hospitals and things like that. But unfortunately, you know, power tends to corrupt, and there's a lot of corruption involved in these political machines that are taking over cities like Baltimore and Cleveland and New York, places like that. Now, immigrants are the machine. Many of these political machine people were first and second generation uh, immigrants. They're people who've come to America, who are wanting to fit into America, and then the next crop of generation, or you know, the next generation of immigrants comes over and they're trying to help them out. So they help them get jobs, they help them through the naturalization process, uh, the process that would get them to become American citizens, okay? Uh, so basically these people coming over from other countries, they have help. Rather than landing on our shores and blindly walking through America not really knowing how to fit in and what to do, uh, they are connecting with people who are helping them get jobs, and that's kind of the political machine there. Now, unfortunately, when loyalty, and we talked about the corruption, but when loyalty wasn't enough, when they're still not going to win with the votes that they had, that they know they're going to get, uh, sometimes they turn to voter fraud. Uh, they would have made-up people electing them or, or casting a vote or dead people casting a vote, okay? And voter fraud even exists today with all of our technology. It's much easier to have voter fraud back in the day uh, without technology, okay? Um, so we talked about graft. Basically, graft was, was overcharging for something and then taking a kickback, uh, the extra money going into your pocket. So make sure you understand what graft is. Uh, political machines were great about using bribes to get what they wanted, whether that meant bribing a policeman or a judge or some other city official to get what they wanted. Uh, not all mayors were, were political bosses. Sometimes they were. All right. Now, when we talk about political bosses, the most famous boss in American history was Boss Tweed. Uh, boss Tweed was head of the Tammany Hall political machine, which uh, was in New York. His main years of power was from 1869 to 1871. Um, Probably the Tweed scandal that you read about in your book, the, the one we're talking about in particular, is this courthouse 
that cost the taxpayers of New York City $13 million to build. At least, that's what they were told. But in reality, it cost $3 million. And the $10 million difference went into Boss Tweed's pockets and the people who worked underneath him. All right, so basically, the people of New York are giving their money away to Boss Tweed and his followers. So um, people were starting to figure him out. One of those was Thomas Nast, who was a very famous political cartoonist, um, who often, we'll look at some political cartoons about this, often attacked Boss Tweed, went after Boss Tweed. Uh, for his uh, corruption. Now, eventually Tweed would get, um, he would go to jail. Uh, he was sentenced to prison for some fraud and stuff for 12 years, but they got reduced to one year. Um, then he gets out and he gets arrested again for something else and he ends up, uh, before he goes to prison again, he runs away, he flees to Spain. So he's out there in Spain hiding out and uh, he is recognized by Thomas Nast's political cartoons and uh, they would extradite him back to America. And that'd be the end of uh, Boss Tweed. Now, what we have is a spirit of reform. This has gotten crazy. Americans get tired of it. We want change. We want to fix this problem. Okay? We're going to fix it with a new civil service um, exam. Patronage was the idea that when you win, you surround yourself with your buddies. It doesn't matter if they know what they're doing. That's not important. They're your buddies. They're loyal to you, and you want to be surrounded by loyal people. Now, civil service means merit. Um, we're going to get this down here, this Pendleton Act, Pendleton Civil Service Act, 1883. Um, if you can't pass the test, you can't have a job. If you can't pass the test and prove that you have the knowledge uh, to, that makes you um, re qualified for the position, then you don't get the position. It doesn't matter who you know. So this reform is going to come under three presidents, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, Garfield, and Arthur. Now, Hayes... He is a very moral man. He comes in as a president, and he has uh, a lot of strict morals. And so he's going to end up firing people that he finds that are corrupt. He's trying to get rid of the patronage system. Um, however, this would make Republican stalwarts mad. <laughs> they were called stalwarts. That was the name of their group. And they, they were the conservative people who wanted um, – they want change. They like the system of patronage the way it is. Um, so he has made an enemy out of them, but he is not going to come back as a second-term president. He doesn't even run. He serves his one term, and he happily leaves the presidency. So this sets up a battle between stalwarts and reformers. Stalwarts want to keep patronage. Reformers want to change patronage system and go to a merit system. Now Garfield was for essentially an independent president, but his vice president uh, was a Republican, Chester A. Arthur. And... Um, Garfield ends up, you know, he's really on the side of the reformers. And this makes a guy mad who was fired. He only had his job because uh, the person that put him in position was his friend. Well, he gets fired, and he blames the president for it. So at a train station one day, uh, he finds the president, and he shoots him. And he says, uh, now Chester A. Arthur is president, and everything will be fine. Well, Garfield dies. Obviously, the man goes to prison. And... Um, Chester A. Arthur turns out to be quite the reformer, and, and he, he's even more of a reformer than Garfield was. Uh, it's Chester A. Arthur who passes the Pendleton Civil Service Act of 1883, uh, which made it a civil service law that you had to pass a civil service test or exam uh, to get a job with the government, you know, such as like a postmaster general, something like that. Now, what happens is the political machine is going to be replaced with the big business relationship with the government. So the big business and politics come, become closer and closer than they ever have, okay? Um, now Cleveland himself, Grover Cleveland, he tries to lower tariffs, and tariffs were these taxes placed on imported items into the United States. So he's trying, they're very high right now, which is good for businesses, but bad for the people because they're having to pay more money for goods, okay? So he wants to lower that to make it easier on the common person in America to buy stuff. Congress says no. They don't want that. Um, so they're, they're fighting Grover Cleveland. Now, after him, you get Benjamin Harrison, who beats Grover Cleveland in the next race, presidential race. He raises the tariff to the highest point they've ever been in our history uh, in something that is called the McKinley Act. All right. So by passing those tariffs, he's going to make businessmen 
wealthier because people are having to pay more for their products, okay, uh, at the expense of the common person, okay? So you're seeing big business take over America. However, the reform movement is not dead. We'll soon move into the progressive era, and, and you'll see how people strike back, and they, they want change, and they want reform in their government. Thank you.